Well, hello. I'm glad you have joined us for another week of On the Way. We have been studying through the Gospel of Mark and been taking our time going verse by verse. And we left off in chapter 3. And just to remind you, as we consider the chapter, the verses we looked at previously in chapter 3, especially beginning in verses 13 through 19, Jesus makes a, um, a call upon his disciples. And the call you'll remember is a call to be with him. As you start today or as you take time to watch this video, it's really my prayer that you would just take a few moments, even maybe to pause uh, the video and just uh, spend some time with God. And then, by the way, use this time as we walk through this scripture together to spend some time with God as well. We continue now as Jesus has called these 12 to be his disciples. And Mark continues to unfold the story, and I remind you, he's writing to people like you and me. He's writing to those of us who know Christ as our personal Savior, and he's writing for the purpose of encouraging us. Uh, Mark wants us to see how Jesus walked and then in turn for us to walk as he did. He wants us to follow Jesus. He wants us to follow Jesus on the way, and that's how we got the name for this Bible study. The description is given, or Mark tells the story, that after Jesus called his disciples. Mark writes in verse 20, he says this, So Jesus then went home, and a crowd gathered around him so that they could not even eat. This was a constant issue in the life of Jesus as people were drawn toward him for many reasons. Some were drawn to him because uh, they saw that he was a miracle worker. Some were drawn to him because they saw him as a great teacher. And, and yes, there were some who were drawn to him because they recognized there was just something different about this man. He was a man of passion and compassion and love and that they could see God in this man called Jesus. And so there were all kinds of people that were coming to Jesus to the point that there was no rest and that he could not find even time to eat. And his disciples who were there with him were experiencing this as well. In verse 21, we read about Jesus's family. I remind you that even though uh, Mary uh, gave birth to Jesus as a virgin, that Jesus had uh, other brothers and sisters, half-brothers perhaps, if you want to call them that, as Mary and Joseph had children. And his family heard about it. It says they went out to seize him, to grab him, for they were saying he's out of his mind. Uh, this is not necessarily a, a negative uh, thought where Jesus' family just thinks he's crazy. What the reality is is that Jesus' family was concerned about him. They were concerned that he was exhausted, that he was one who had just been given all that he could give and people kept taking from him. You've been in one of those moments before where you have just given everything you have and you find yourself depleted and exhausted. At the same time, they did struggle to understand who Jesus was. Some of his sayings, some of his teachings did not make sense to them. Uh, they, they just were trying to wrestle with the truth. And you can imagine, by the way, can you imagine being the brother or the sister of Jesus and growing up with him, and suddenly he becomes the savior of the world. Uh, admittedly, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that they faced. But they came to Jesus, and they said that he is out of his mind. In the meantime, we read about this little interlude that takes place. In verse 22, let me read it uh, through the passage in verses 20 through 22 through 27. So the scribes who came down from Jerusalem, they were saying, Jesus is possessed by Beelzebub, uh, the king of demons, uh, and by the prince of demons, he cast out the demons. So they're saying uh, Jesus is possessed by the king of demons, the prince of demons, and that he cast out demons because he is the prince of demons. Just the logic of it didn't make sense. And you'll discover in life that when people cast accusations against you, especially accusations about your walk with Christ, that lots of times what they say just simply doesn't make sense. It just shows that they're just throwing anything they can. These are doing that. So they say he's possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he cast out the demons, that his power is from, the, from Satan as well. And Jesus called, them, called out to them and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? Uh, it's a logical question. Uh, they said that uh, Jesus is casting out demons by the prince of demons. And he says, uh, Jesus said, this doesn't even make logical sense. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom's divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Jesus reminds them that if this is true, 
then uh, they are essentially tearing themselves apart. And we know, we know that Satan's kingdom is defeated, but we also know that at least for the time here upon this earth, that Satan uh, does have power, not as much power as God, but he is powerful and his kingdom is very much alive and well in this place. Jesus is just saying, what you're proposing, scribes and Pharisees, just don't make sense. And by the way, these were the scribes. These were the learned people. And perhaps Jesus was uh, kind of taking an extra jab at them, perhaps uh, prodding them a little bit more because even though they were the well-educated, the scribes, Jesus says, what you're saying just doesn't make sense at all. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. A family, when it fights with each other, the family falls apart. The family falls. If Satan, he says in verse 6, has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. The reality is, is that Satan is coming to an end. But it's not because Satan is fighting against Satan. It's because Jesus has conquered Satan. But in this passage, what Jesus is trying to help them say is this. I'm not possessed by a demon. I am not casting out uh, demons and doing miracles because I have a demonic spirit within me. Jesus says if that was true, the whole kingdom of Satan would be falling because they're fighting against each other. And Jesus wants them to understand, I, I cast out demons because I am God. I have the authority and the power of God that is greater than demons. So he says that if uh, Satan has risen up against himself, divided, he cannot stand, he's coming to an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder it. Jesus tells another part of a parable. Somebody can't break into your house and they cannot um, tear it apart and ramsack it and plunder it and take those things unless he first binds the strong man. In other words, Jesus' parable is a reminder to them that if someone is taken captive, it's not because there is one like them, it's because there is a stronger person. The robber, the intruder, is able to plunder a house because he is strong, stronger and he has bound the other people in the house so that he can rob and can ransack. Jesus says then, I'm not able to do these things because I'm a demon or the son of a demon. I'm able to do these things because I am stronger than a demon. By the way, it's interesting to me. Jesus had the chance to attack the scribes, and he did somewhat attack them. But he also tried to teach them. He was also fully aware that while he was being attacked by them, there were these people called disciples watching. And they were waiting to see how Jesus would respond in a very logical manner, a very calm manner, Jesus says, what you're saying is not um, logical. It doesn't make sense because I am the stronger person here. I cast out demons because I am stronger than demons. Then Jesus looks at them. Oh, by the way, before we move on, let me just remind you, um, part of following Christ means that we watch and see how Jesus responds but it's also being fully aware that others are watching us, others who are following Christ, others whom we are encouraging to follow Christ. They're watching us to see how we will respond as well. And so Jesus uses his teaching moment, but Jesus is not finished. Here's what he says. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. A very controversial verse, a verse that's oftentimes taken out of context when we talk about blasphemy of the Spirit. Um, Jesus says everything is forgivable. That's where we start. All, all sins, all blasphemies, things that we say, things that we do, those things are forgivable. The only thing that's not forgivable is when we blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. In the context here, what these men had refused to do is they had refused to acknowledge the work of the Holy Spirit. And instead of saying it's the Holy Spirit, instead of saying it's God who cast out demons, they were saying it's demons who cast out demons. And Jesus says the only sin that's really unforgivable 
is the sin of not recognizing God's work, even more so the sin of attributing to Satan the work of God. These men were saying this is happening not because of Jesus, this is happening because of Satan. Jesus says it's only because of my work, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, that you can find forgiveness. So if you deny the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, if you deny that there's a Holy Spirit, if you deny that he's at work, then there will never be forgiveness because the Holy Spirit is the one who brings forgiveness. And so Jesus is making a very strong accusation against these men. They came at Jesus and Jesus has taught them and said, look, I am stronger, but let me just remind you of this. If you continue to insist that my work is equivalent with the work of Satan, then I want you to understand you have placed yourself in a very dangerous position because Satan can't save you, only I can. And if you deny my work, if you deny the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can never be forgiven. You and I are forgiven because Jesus died upon the cross and the scripture tells us that because he died on the cross, we are forgiven and the Holy Spirit begins a work within us to make us new, to make us into new creations. It's the Holy Spirit who works within us and transforms us. Jesus says, don't deny that work. Embrace and accept that work. You and I need to be aware that the Holy Spirit is alive and active in our lives. And he's changing us. Never deny the work of Christ. You're always putting yourself in a very dangerous position when you do so. Accept God's work in your life. Let him forgive you. Let him save you. Let him make you new. Let him correct you. Let him convict you. Let him do what only he can do and recognize it is the work of the Spirit within us. It's a gift from God. Finally, in these final words of chapter 3, we read these words. And so Jesus, uh, mother and brothers, by the way, picking up where we left off. You remember they came and they said he's out of his mind. They came and standing outside, they sent sent to him and they called to him. By the way, this is referred to as a bookend. A bookend is when an event happens something else occurs, and then the rest of the first event occurs. Jesus' mother and family, his family came and said, Jesus is out of his mind. Then the story of Beelzebub happens, and now we pick this back up. So here's the bookend again. And so his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent him, and they called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here for you. They're seeking you. Now, Jesus is going to respond, and we, we don't want to take this in a negative light. I don't think that's what Jesus was intending. Here's these people coming saying, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here. You can't help but think that they were somewhat uh, in awe of the fact that Jesus' mother and brothers were here. Um, and, and so they say that they're here, and Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? He's not denying that they are his mother and brother. He loves Mary. He loves his brothers. Uh, He's thankful for them, and he, I'm sure, expresses appreciation to his father for them over and over again. But what he's doing at this point is he's trying to say, I want you to understand, I have a special relationship with them. But all of you who are followers of mine, all of you who've been listening to me as I teach, all of you who've been following after me, Jesus says, I want you to understand, we have a very special relationship as well. Listen to what he says. Who are my mother and my brothers? This is Jesus saying they're not isolated just to Mary and uh, James and Jude, uh, my brothers and my mother. Looking at those who sat around him, he said, and by the way, these are the people who were just sitting at the feet of Jesus. They were ones who were taking in the truth and trying to apply it to life. And Jesus says, here, you, here are my mother and my brothers. You are the ones who are in intimate relationship with me. For whoever does the will of God, this is my brother and my sister and my mother. So in this interesting turn of events, this passage we've looked at today has several turn of interesting turn of events. One is when the scribes, educated people, say that Jesus is Satan casting out Satan. That's one of the issues. The other issue is that uh, Jesus' family was concerned about him and they came to him. And Jesus doesn't discount them or he doesn't set them aside, but instead what Jesus does is Jesus says, I want you to understand that just as I have a special relationship with them, I have a special relationship with you. You are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters. Be encouraged. Be encouraged that today that God looks at you 
when you follow after him and when you do his will. And by the way, the assumption is any person who follows Christ, any person who is a believer, is not one who simply professes Christ, but it's one who professes Christ and follows Christ. They do what Christ has called them to do. Jesus says, this, this is my brother. This is my brother. This is my sister. This is my family. We are the family. May God bless you as you continue on the way. I look forward to picking up in chapter 4 next time as we study about a most familiar parable, the parable of the sower. May God bless you.